Hi, everybody. Uh, this week, I'm just making a brief presentation to introduce you to the concept of simulation principles. I will try to do this as the course goes on. I think it will be helpful to draw out some of the key points for learning each week and emphasize what is important in all the information that I am um, giving you to read and to watch. And so my purpose in creating this, this short presentation is just to uh, give you the key takeaways about the articles this week in addition to driving home some of the key concepts of simulation as I, I guess this may be pretty unfamiliar to most of you based on this class historically most students aren't using discrete event simulation in their work although they're aware of its use perhaps uh, and have some slight familiarity with its principles but most students are not familiar with simulation so I hope that this is helpful to you. So the question to be asked, first of all, is uh, what is simulation? Um, you know, I guess today most people when they hear simulation might think of virtual reality, things like that, but in, in actuality, in industry at this point, it's a, it's a pretty simple and straightforward thing. Uh, White and Ingalls, who authored the first article you were assigned, they defined it as simply experimentation with a model. So using a model to model a system and then making decisions about the system based on what the model um, shows. And we'll definitely get into this in more detail as the semester goes on. Something to keep in mind is that the model is always going to be a uh, more simple than the system itself. So for example, if you were modeling a production line, it would be impossible to include every detail of that production line in a simulation model and still stay within your time and budget constraints. Uh, and so the model is going to be simplified showing only the most important details of that system. Uh, and sufficient details so that it emulates the system as closely as possible. Uh, simulation is a useful tool in that it enables the investigation of a system uh, in situations where it may be impossible, unpractical, or even dangerous to study the actual system itself. So, for example, if you were looking at a, a manufacturing system and you were asking the question, do we replace a machine or do we rearrange the production line uh, in order to be more efficient or to obtain more throughput, those would be some pretty expensive investigations to uh, carry out if you were looking at the line itself. But simulating the line with a computer would allow you to... Uh, predict how those changes would affect the actual physical system itself. White and Ingalls mentioned that the Wright brothers back in the early 1900s used the simulation of a wind tunnel in order to design the wings for their gliders at first and then as they moved into airplanes they were able to predict how the wing designs would uh, perform under different wind conditions uh, last summer, my family and I visited the Henry Ford, which is in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, you may not know this, but Henry Ford collected historic homes, and many of them are at the Henry Ford in Detroit. And one of those homes is actually the birthplace of the Wright brothers from Dayton, Ohio. And uh, if you're not familiar with their story or you haven't read the book uh, that David McCullough wrote about them, the Wright brothers started out as bicycle mechanics and they had a fascination with flying and so they were tinkerers and working on how you could glide in the wind and then finally of course they uh, developed a motorized airplane and so uh, one of the docents there at the Henry Ford talked about how the Wright brothers used wind tunnel simulation and I have a short video that will uh, explain that in his words
was in a cardboard box, and they would have a fan at one end and blow in there, tornado with just put little models in there, and they see some results. This is the, when the idea that Wintel came to them, build something full scale and go at it. So what they would do is they would put different uh, wings, designs in there, crank, get some wind over it, and then they would watch it, calculate. After many different tries and mistakes, they felt this was the correct case for what they were doing. And that's basically how it was made to rest so quickly. So notice that uh, he said that the reason they progressed quickly in their development of uh, motorized flight was because they used simulation. And so if you think of simulation as a, um, in, a, in a visual format, the way that I see it is that you have uh, inputs that uh, enter into a system and then you have outputs that come from that system that help you to make some decisions. So inputs are things that act on the environment of the system. So for example, I think in the, in the White and Ingalls article, they talk about telephone calls at a call center. Uh, you can have inputs of, of raw materials. You can have inputs of people. Uh, and each of these um, inputs have attributes as well, and they have qualities. And, and as we look at simulation systems, you'll see that um, the variables of the inputs are going to definitely be influenced by the system. And so then those inputs go into the system. So this could be your manufacturing line, this could be your call center, and they are going to change, change state the internal uh, conditions of the system are going to change as a result of those inputs and then the system is going to produce outputs and these are some measured quantities that are um, going to help answer the questions that the simulation is is seeking so for example back to our production line you know if we rearrange the production line or add a new piece of equipment how are the outputs going to change and outputs could be things like uh, parts produced per hour or parts produced per shift or um, similar similar elements like that so the outputs are going to give us the answers that we're looking for hopefully in a well-designed simulation so now let's look at some simulation uh, some simulation definitions and uh, these are discussed in the uh, White and Ingalls article. So entities are uh, elements of the of the system that uh, can be machines, they can be parts, they can be people, but all of these entities are going to have uh, qualities to them. Uh, they're going to have attributes such as um, the product type, uh, the start time uh, of a the length of a queue, what the population of the Q can be. A Q, Q-U-E-U-E, -U -U -E, is what we would commonly call a line. If you're waiting in line, Qs are a really important part of, um, of simulation systems. Activities, these are the processes within a system. Uh, Qs would fall under the category of activities. Uh, delays would fall under the category of activities. Uh, logic would fall under the category of activities. So uh, there is that. Resources are any item in a simulation with a constrained capacity. So for example, a person, personnel within your system. Uh, people are resources within the system because they have uh, limited time. So if you have a worker who's working a shift, that individual only has a certain amount of time for responsibilities such as setting up machines. Uh, a conveyor belt has limited resources. Uh, you can only put so many parts on a conveyor or a conveyor can only move at a certain speed. A global variable is a limitation or a constraint that helps to configure the system. So for example, if your system is an emergency room, what's, what is the maximum number of people that can be in the system at one time? There is a, a capacity there that is a, a global variable for the system. 
A random number generator is something that we will be talking about uh, pretty extensively in this class because it's a key part of a simulation. Uh, anything that is random within the system has to use a random number generator in order to determine when things are going to happen. So for example, back to our emergency room example, uh, how do you determine when people arrive at the hospital to be seen in the emergency room? A random number generator can uh, provide that randomness. So obviously people aren't arriving in a really predictable fashion and so there has to be some kind of randomness to their arrival times and we're going to discuss this in much greater detail in a future module. You may be familiar with the term FIFO or first in first out. FIFO is just determining the order which entities are ranked when they enter a queue. So for example, um, if one individual arrives after another individual and you're using a, a FIFO uh, system, people are going to be addressed in the order that they arrive. Similarly, product that comes to a machine is going to be accepted in a FIFO manner. The ones that arrive first are going to be the ones that leave first because they're going to be processed in the order they arrive. So what are some key takeaways from the articles uh, for this week? Uh, I would just like to recommend as you read the articles, the method that I use to avoid printing everything out is I just save the articles in their PDF format to, uh, I use Evernote, uh, I like it a lot, you can mark it up, you can save things indefinitely. You could also use Google Drive or Google Docs and save those articles and then I just pull them up on my iPad and sit down with a legal pad and write out the key points and the key things that I want to remember from the articles so that may be helpful to you. Uh, but the key takeaway from the White and Ingalls article, and, and we'll talk more about the statistics behind uh, simulations, but what they emphasize is that you have to have multiple iterations or multiple runs of a simulation in order to have reasonably good confidence intervals. So I think the example that they give, they talk about the rolling a pair of dice and that you cannot make conclusions about a system. You can't make decisions from a simulation model after just running it once or twice. Uh, and you know that working in manufacturing. If you are uh, looking at one day's worth of data, you can't make decisions based on that one day's worth of data. Let's say that it's a, a Friday and you have multiple people out sick, or it's uh, Monday morning and everyone is tired from coming off of the weekend. Uh, you can't make decisions based on just one run of your model. And so they recommend 30 uh, iterations to have a reasonably good confidence interval. Uh, I would say that's a good starting point and we'll talk more about those kind of uh, decisions in a future module. Brown and Sturrock talk about uh, having good communication between the simulation practitioner and people who will be making decisions uh, about the model. Their article was cost reduction and performance improvement opportunities with simulation and they talk about the making of HVAC units and uh, I believe one of them worked for a consulting firm but the first five sections just talk about the different processes used in making the HVAC units and what they were trying to do at the beginning was just make a, a valid model that mirrored what was happening in this production facility and the goal was to increase the throughput and decrease the work in process. Um, they found that if the production schedules were aligned with one another, they could improve the WIP uh, by reducing it 37%, and they were increasing the throughput very effectively, uh, and they had some other uh, successful findings. What had to happen, though, is after the simulation was run, the those who were in charge of the simulation, who we would call the simulation practitioners, they had to have really open communication with the people who would be making decisions on the factory floor based on those model findings. And I think that was a, a very important point that anyone should take away from, from that article. 
And then finally, the last article was by Kuhn, and uh, he advocated for a digital factory. In other, in other words, using simulation in an ongoing manner to help um, an organization to optimize their processes, to help uh, with superior knowledge sharing. And the digital factory in this paper just represents a, a common repository of knowledge that helps enable real collaboration across an organization. And he talked about things like product lifecycle management, uh, optimizing the flow of your product, and you know the use of some of these advanced simulation packages on today's market would make this possible, but a company would have to be really committed to doing it. And I think even just doing some of the things that Qin uh, recommends on a smaller scale could be really uh, beneficial to any organization. I would say the only downfall to his recommendations would be the expense involved and the expertise that's necessary to carry out a full implementation of a digital factory. But as I said, just taking some of his ideas could be really beneficial for co collaboration and optimization. Uh, remember that if you have any questions or feedback that you want to give, you can use the Anytime Feedback form in the left side menu in Blackboard. Uh, and please feel free to send me an email with any questions or comments you might have. So I uh, trust that you're off to a good start, and I look forward to your first assignment. Thanks, everybody.